Hi, everyone. I'm Elaine Quijano. It is good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Top Democrats in the Senate have reached a consensus on the size of their single-party reconciliation package. Now comes potentially the harder part, selling it to the rest of their party. The $3.5 trillion proposal is separate from the bipartisan infrastructure deal. This one includes spending for Democratic priorities like child care and climate change. At issue remains how to fund the plan. President Biden met with those leaders on Wednesday. He also met with a group of mayors and governors to discuss the bipartisan deal targeting more traditional infrastructure. There's no, uh, there are no Democratic roads or Republican bridges, and, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, but there are families uh, in need of uh, shorter commute times, safer commutes. Kids need to be able to drink clean drinking water. It doesn't have lead in it. Uh, and communities need to have reliable transit systems. And uh, we have a chance to solve these problems, a bipartisan chance to solve these problems, we create millions of jobs, literally, not, not uh, $7 an hour jobs, even $15 an hour jobs, but jobs of prevailing wages, making $46, $50 an hour with benefits. Meanwhile, the White House is taking steps to reassure the world it will not leave behind those who helped the U.S. during the 20-year war in Afghanistan. Here is White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki earlier. We are launching what we are calling Operation Allies Refuge to support relocation flights for interested and eligible Afghan nationals and their families who have supported the United States uh, and our partners in Afghanistan and, and, and are in the SIV application pipeline. In terms of the specific numbers, I'm not going to be able to provide those to you uh, for operational and security reasons, but I can confirm that flights out of Afghanistan for SIV applicants who are already in the pipeline will begin in the last week of July and will continue. And our objective is to get individuals who are eligible uh, relocated out of the country in advance of the remove of the withdrawal of troops uh, at the end of August. Meantime, the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th Capitol attack will hold its first hearing on July 27th. It remains to be seen if Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy will assign any Republicans to the investigation led by Democrats. For more, let's bring in Natalie Brand, Josh Kraushar, and Kadia Goba. Natalie covers Capitol Hill and the White House for CBS News. Josh is the National Journal's senior national political columnist. He writes the weekly Against the Grain column. And Kadia is a political reporter for BuzzFeed News. Welcome. It's good to have you all. Natalie, let me begin with you. Democrats are pushing a $3.5 trillion top line for their reconciliation package. That's a big sum, but a lot less than what progressives were actually hoping for. What kind of spending for social programs is included? Hi, Elaine. Good to be with you. We know that Senator Bernie Sanders, as you referenced, he wanted something a lot bigger, around $6 trillion. So late Tuesday night, we got word that this new deal was reached with a price tag of around $3.5 trillion, focused on what the administration and also Senate Democrats have called human infrastructure. That's investments in, in child care, uh, the expanded tax credit that the president president has been talking about, and also a large focus on climate initiatives. Uh, Senate Democrats released a, a list of top-line proposals uh, in about a one-page uh, piece of paper. But at this point, we're waiting to see a lot more details of what exactly each measure entails. Uh, but we know that what's in it largely echoes what President Biden has talked about uh, in the administration's American Families Plan. And this is really now taking the shape of this uh, Senate Democratic budget proposal, which they aim to pass through reconciliation, that procedural tool which would uh, not require Republican support. But in order to get it done that way, they recognize they cannot afford to lose a single Senate Democratic vote in this 50-50 Senate. Uh, and so that involves making sure everyone within the Senate Democratic caucus uh, is on the same page. Also explains why President Biden paid a visit to Capitol Hill during the lunch hour on Wednesday 
way to try to solidify support across uh, all sides of the party of, of Senate Democrats. And we know that there are some party moderates, uh, namely West Virginia's Joe Manchin, who have uh, expressed concern over how to pay for this proposal and what exactly is in it. So, uh, you know, unified Democratic support is not a uh, hundred percent guaranteed at this point and it also comes while there's this separate bipartisan physical infrastructure bill that you mentioned that is still in the final negotiation phase in terms of trying to come up with a legislative text. We know that that deal was announced a couple weeks ago, uh, but those members, that bipartisan group, still trying to iron out some of their outstanding issues. And then the whole question becomes this negotiation of which gets a vote first and how they impact each other on the floor. Uh, does the fact that this reconciliation mm -hmm. bill is moving forward, does that uh, spook some Republicans from supporting that bipartisan plan, or are these on two separate tracks? How this all unfolds remains to be seen, and as you know, uh, August recess is looming. So the timeline very much in, up in the air as well is the exact details and what transpires here on Capitol Hill moving forward. Yeah, so many variables to consider. But, uh, Kadia, on that bipartisan infrastructure deal, so President Biden is also trying to sell it to a group of mayors and governors. Tell us what is happening at that meeting. Yeah, so uh, a group of mayors and governors came to the Hill today. Um, and it's important to know he not only is going after that group, but there's also the Progressive Caucus, who he needs to win over, right? And um, Rep Representative Jayapel, who is the chair of the CPC, or Congressional Progressive Caucus, told reporters today that she was pleased that at least five or five of the priorities that the Progressive Caucus were interested in, she sees them inside the framework. And that's including, obviously, affordable housing and Medicare expansion, and of course, the care economy. It'll be very interesting um, if the entire caucus is on board and if we hear some pushback. Mm. Of course, she was very clear to make the point that she needs more details, obviously, to um, obviously give mm -hmm. it a 100 uh, percent stamp. But I, I think that's a, a quite a, an interesting um, that she was backing it so quickly after it was introduced today. Yeah, that is interesting to note because members of the Progressive Caucus have not been shy about voicing when they happen to disagree <laughs> um, with the administration on, on various things. Um, Josh, I want to turn to some of your reporting because you've been looking at polling from a Democratic firm which finds that crime for the first time is outranking the pandemic as the top issue for voters. What else do those results say about how Americans actually see this issue? Well, it's fascinating, Elaine, because while Democrats on Capitol Hill are focused on, on the economy and the Biden White House believes that a successful economy with a big landmark piece of legislation passed with bipartisan support is key to their fortunes in the midterms, in the states, in, in these big swing states, swing districts, crime is, is becoming a really, really big hot button issue. Uh, it was the number one issue in the New York City mayoral primary in one of the most democratic liberal cities in the country, and one where the more moderate uh, candidate among Democrats, Eric Adams, prevailed. And in this poll, mm -hmm. the, the, the poll from a Democratic polling firm shows that not only is crime, violent crime, the number one issue across the country, but it's the only issue that both Republicans and Democrats care equally about. It's one of their top issues on both sides, even the pandemic. Republicans don't care about the pandemic that much anymore. Of all the 14 issues tested, crime was the only one to rank high within both parties. So this is a, an issue that that's why Biden met with law enforcement officials, met with Eric Adams this week at the White House. Uh, it's an issue that, that's, that's very difficult because you have a very outspoken progressive base that doesn't uh, want to 
uh, hear about more money for the police, more, more, more police officers on the streets to deal with the rising violent crime. But it's one I think that Biden is going to have to confront and even challenge the, the progressives in his own party if he wants to have a successful midterm election. So, Josh, with that in mind, I want to ask you about the slogan, defund the police. You wrote that Democrats allowed left-wing activists to shape the party's agenda. What is the political fallout, and what are Democrats doing about it? Yeah, well, the, the frustrating thing for Democrats is that this was a slogan that was only adopted by a small handful of the most ardent activists, the, the, the handful of squad members on, on Capitol Hill. But, you know, it, it was seen by a lot of voters, especially in, in the middle of the country, as, as an issue that defined the Democratic Party's view on crime, law and order, uh, and, and on all these related issues. So um, the challenge for Democrats, and this is when I talk to Democratic pollsters and strategists, they're a little bit worried that it's not good enough just to say, I'm not part of this defund the police crab. They're worried that Democrats, like mm -hmm. Eric Adams did in New York City, to actually challenge some of the more extreme elements within the, within the party, take on some of the more strident views within the, the progressive movement, because that is a big political challenge in, in these battleground states and battleground districts that are going to be fought in the midterm elections. So, Kadia, against that backdrop, you have Senators Tim Scott and Cory Booker, who've been working to reach a deal on police reform legislation. They already missed an early July deadline, but said that they were close. Where do things actually stand right now? We're still stalled. Um, the last um, reporting out was about uh, Representative Karen Bass, who said the struggle was between was among the fight between uh uh, police unions. And um, uh, to my understanding, there are two large ones that they're are, are trying to convince uh, the Tim Scott camp that um, as long as they're part of it, that they should move forward. Um, but Tim Scott, Senator Tim Scott said the other day, he told reporters that, you know, basically it's if he doesn't see something within the near future, he doesn't think that this is going to be or, or that the, the the talks are going to happen. I just I just want to even point out that Tim Scott even had problems with police reform in his own state. So this is a, a mass undertaking mm -hmm. between a couple of senators and members of Congress or representatives to um, try to accomplish this. It, it, it does not seem hopeful, but we're still mm -hmm. just waiting to see what's going on exactly. Yeah, I mean, it really is a mammoth undertaking. And as others who have studied this issue have pointed out, you've got so many differences among the various municipalities and police departments and agencies across the country. So trying to tackle this from a national perspective um, is really fraught with so many challenges. But we'll continue to watch that. Um, Josh, I want to turn to another topic with you. It's interesting. Former President George W. Bush is speaking out about the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Now, he has generally not weighed in when it comes to his successors, but he spoke out. Um, Afghanistan, of course, was a war that he launched while he was commander-in-chief. Let's go ahead and listen to an interview he did with a German broadcaster that was released today. I'm afraid Afghan women and girls are going to suffer unspeakable harm. Is it a mistake? The withdrawal. Of I, you know, I think it is, yeah. I think because I think the consequences are going to be unbelievably bad. And uh, I'm sad. And we, I spend, Laura and I spend a lot of time with Afghan women, and, uh, uh, and they're scared. And I think about all the interpreters and people that helped not only U.S. troops, but NATO troops. And they're just, it seems like they're just going to be left behind to be slaughtered by these very brutal people. And uh, it breaks my heart. Josh, we know the Taliban has rapidly retaken land almost as quickly as the U.S. leaves it. What is the Biden administration doing to help some of those people that the former president was talking about? Well, Jen Psaki, the White House press secretary today, talked about uh, emergency efforts to rescue Afghans to, that helped the United States military over, over the decades. But I don't know if that's good enough. And look, for President Bush, who 
never speaks out about politics, never criticizes mm-hmm. his predecessors, didn't speak out, yeah. rarely spoke out, I should say, uh, even against Trump's extremism in office. For him to, to give this interview and to be so uh, clear and, and, and offer that kind of moral clarity is a really uh, big mm-hmm. moment. Um, it t- shows you um, just, I mean, I, I think politically there is a, so this weird alliance on the left and the right that just wants the troops out. They're glad that we're leaving Afghanistan. But you look, if, if, if the military situation worsens, if we have increased terrorism from, from the region, uh, if there's a human rights catastrophe, it is going to be on the Biden administration's watch. And that's something that, that Bush is very much attuned to. And the fact that he chose to speak out so publicly and so clearly uh, shows how, how high the stakes are. Absolutely. I mean, having covered the George W. Bush administration, I know that was like a family principle for the Bush family um, to not speak out uh, when it came to successors, something that his father did not do, something that he, as you say, rarely did. So it is pretty remarkable to listen to the former president today. Um, Switching gears, Natalie, new fundraising totals out show the National Republican Conference Committee outraising the Democratic Committee, 45 to 36.5 million in the second quarter. In June alone, Republicans raised 20 million compared to Democrats, 14 million. What do those numbers tell you? Well, I think, Elaine, it definitely tells us that is it is going to be a contentious and competitive uh, election season leading up to November 2022. It also shows that Republicans, party leaders and donors think they have a real shot at taking back the House. Uh, and I think we're going to see them especially target uh, those swing districts and any uh, Democratic members who perhaps flipped uh, seats in 2018, uh, who are now perceived as potentially vulnerable, I think we're going to see a big play for some of those districts, especially after a House Republican started to to make some gains in 2020 uh, and narrow the, the margin in the House, the balance of power, which is a very slim uh, Democratic majority. So uh, I definitely think that that's where the focus will be leading into next year and our very astute, uh, great political unit at CBS News, uh, including reporter Aaron Navarro, also points out that Republicans have also made a significant gains on, gains rather, on the digital uh, fundraising outreach side of things. And that's an area where historically uh, they've lagged uh, their Democratic counterparts. So now they're really starting to try to make a play um, in that arena as they try to really rev up uh, and appeal to to all parts of the party uh, for support heading into a com- very competitive midterm season. So, Natalie, given all of that, how should we understand the record fundraising totals just posted by Republicans Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger? They have taken heat for their criticisms of former President Trump. Yeah, and I think this speaks to to the Republican Party still being divided. There is support for moderate Republicans, uh, Republicans and leaders who have spoken out against former President Trump. And so we are seeing uh, some interesting uh, alliances form uh, in terms of where the money is coming in for, for those two candidates. In Congresswoman Cheney's case, it also speaks to, uh, to her history her roots in her district and her family's history uh, in terms of politics and fundraising. Uh, And we know um, that After that impeachment, the second impeachment vote, there was a trend of uh, support for moderate Republicans uh, by other parts of the party or groups who were uh, anti-Trump or uh, trying to prop up and support candidates who were speaking uh, to a different side of uh, conservatism. So at this point, we're seeing uh, a lot of support Nationally, we'll have to see these are going to be very nationalized races. We'll have to see what happens in uh, the individual districts, especially during uh, a very crowded, potentially crowded GOP primary, uh, which 
that could be, be an uphill battle, but we'll have to wait and see, Elaine. All right. Well, Kadia, let's turn to voting rights. The administration is engaging in some very public outreach to Americans with disabilities. They argue that those Americans have been excluded from the fight over voting rights. What is the political calculus here, and uh, what is Vice President Harris doing on that front? I think it's a voting block that has long been neglected, and this would be this is a great opportunity to hone in onto some of the forgotten voters or constituents. Um, it is very easy to, you know, target um, voters of color, which seems to be um, something both parties are doing. But when you do look at uh, members of the of communities with um, disabilities, they are important. They are, uh, uh, there's a, an immediate tie-in with health care there, um, which is, you'll see mm -hmm. in, uh, in the infrastructure, the soft infrastructure plan. So it is. It it is. It, it's a, It's an extremely uh, calculated, but I think very important um, transition for the Biden administration and, and a smart one. Yeah, and something definitely to watch here in the months ahead. All right, Natalie Brand, Josh Kraushar, and Kadia Goba. It's good to have you all. Thank you very much.